sure that's probably what you people are interested in, but um, that's it. it's a blog site, so that you have to get used to everything in your backwards order, because the latest post is always on top. So, uh, preceptsgroup.org website. So, the book of Ephesians. First of all, I want to look at kind of a broad view of the book. And the book of Ephesians, as Mike has said, is in many ways the, the, the premier book, the, the capstone of divine revelation, uh, capstone of truth for today. And I, I have uh, different titles I could come up with for it. And one of my favorite ones is I like to call it the book of God's present purpose. Because it talks about God's purposes for today. It talks about what God is, is doing today, what he's accomplishing through this present dispensation of grace. In many ways, it's uh, the book of God's grace. It talks about God's grace and grace, they, those, uh, those unsearchable riches of God's grace, those incomparable riches of God's grace in the book of Ephesians. The capstone of truth for today. And it's also, I would say, the book of being in Christ. And it talks about being in Christ and gives that concept. The concept is, is very dominant throughout the book. Now, just a a very, very broad outline of the book is that in the first three chapters, Ephesians 1 through 3, we have what God has done for us in Christ. And so it's talking to those of us who are in Christ. And therefore, I would say the book of Ephesians is not really written to people who aren't believers. It's not really written to unbelievers trying to teach them the gospel. It's written from the start to people who are in Christ and telling us about our, ourselves in Christ. So it's not, not really written to convert people at all, but it's written to people who are already in Christ. It's written to believers from beginning to end. But Ephesians 1 through 3 tells us what God has done for us in Christ. And Ephesians 3 in particular tells us God's present purpose and work. And in my book on the Jigsaw Bible, I went through Ephesians chapter 3 and showed you those things about God's present purpose and work. But then in Ephesians 4 through 6, it talks about our worthy walk, as the King James translates it. And what that means is, is the appropriate lifestyle that we should live in view of the fact of all God has done for us in Christ. Because we are in Christ, because this God has done all these things for us, our response should be to walk worthy of that, to live a lifestyle that's worthy of all that God has done for us. So Ephesians 4 through 6 is, is the appropriate lifestyle, the lifestyle that's worthy of all that God has done for us in Christ. So let's look at this uh, book chapter by chapter. Really take, a, like I said, a, a broad view of the book. And needless to say, in 45 minutes, I, I can't go into any great details. But and we can look throughout the book. And I'm going to, Mike printed all his verses up front. I'm going to make you open your Bibles and, and look for yourself. <laughs> but if he's in chapter 1, we start off first, we have the author, Paul. Of course, that's the man we've been talking about this morning. And he's the one through whom Paul Paul is the one through whom God reveals this special truth for today. And then we have the recipients. It says, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, there are some manuscript arguments about whether the words in Ephesus belong. And it, it could be that the, this book was really written as a, a letter to, uh, we could put it to, the, to the, this, those being and believing in Christ. Uh, the, the saints, I don't believe it's the faithful in Christ Jesus, that would make it to, uh, we might say, the mature believers, the, the most faithful believers. And that word depends on whether it's transitive or intransitive, if you remember your English. It can be faithful or it can just mean believing. In this case, I mean believing. It doesn't mean the, the faithful, like this book is just to the faithful believers, the unfaithful, it's not to them. Because then you'd have chapter 4 where it says things like, don't lie, don't steal. Does that make any sense for people who have already been termed faithful in Christ Jesus? No. That, that sounds like it's the very youngest and most immature of believers that's speaking to there. So I think this book is to those who are being and believing in Christ Jesus. Just everyone who is in Christ, every, and the way you get in Christ is by believing in Jesus Christ, by believing the record God gave of him, uh, that he is God's son, the Savior, that he died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And we believe that. God places us in Christ, and then this book is written to us. So now verses 3 through 14, uh, and this is a, a very interesting section because this is uh, perhaps the longest sentence uh, that, that there is in recorded literature. It's a gigantic sentence. 
And this sentence is, is really talking, if we look at verse 3, we can see what the, you know, to understand any subject, sentence, you need to know what the subject is and what the verb is, what it's talking about, right? And that's right away in verse 3 where it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who... And if I was going to diagram the sentence, that who there is the subject, but of course it's referring right back there to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is really the subject. And then the verb is has blessed. Has blessed. But in our English word blessed is kind of hard to understand. It's a little bit of a word that we use and don't, it, it gives us a vaguely good feeling that there's something good about it. We don't necessarily know what it means. But the Greek word there is uh, eulogeo. And we get our English word eulogize from that. And of course, we eulogize somebody like at a, at a funeral. You eulogize them, you say good things about them, or sometimes at a retirement. Somebody's retiring and you kind of eulogize their career. But this word didn't have anything to do with funerals or, or anything like that. It just meant to speak well of something, someone in Greek. So God uh, is the subject. What he's done is he's spoken well. And then who has he spoken well of? He's spoken well of us. And who is us there? Well, it's the, the Paul and those who he's writing this letter to, which is those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ through believing in him. That God has spoken well of us. And I believe the whole sentence then, this gigantic sentence, is about the things that God has said about us. Well, how has he spoken well of us? Did he just make things up? He's a snappy dresser, has nice hair color. No. Well, that's not, he's, he's not fishing for compliments. What he's doing is saying the glorious things that are true of us. That's what, he's, that's what he's saying about us. Those of us who are in Christ. In verse 4, he chose us in him. Uh, we are chosen. That's one of the things he says about us. We're chosen by him. We're chosen in Christ. Before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. So one thing he says about us is that we're chosen. Then he says, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. We are predestined to adoption as sons, to adoption as to sonship. And that's a whole lesson in and of itself. What exactly does it mean to be adopted as a son? Because I don't think being adopted as a son is the same thing as being adopted as a child. They're two very different things. But he has predestined us to be adopted as his sons, and that's that's true of men and women. Because a son has to do with, uh, with inheritance. It's, it goes back to the idea of a family business. Or when you have a family business and your family is dependent upon it, if, if that business fails, you might starve to death. It's very important when the, when the leader of that business can't run it anymore, who's going to take over for him? And that's the son. So the son has the idea of, of inheritance and of the one who can stand in for the father, the one who will take the father's place when he retires. And so the family business continues. So he's predestined us to be representatives of God. To, uh, that, that God will represent himself through us in the future. And that will happen when we are adopted as sons. So then, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So he's poured out his grace upon us in Christ. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So we're chosen, we're predestined to be sons. We have redemption through his blood. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will or the secret of his intention. He, he's letting us know his plans and his purposes for today. Like I said, chapter 3 is all about that. Um, verse 11, in him also we are chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And so forth. And then in verse 13, having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, he says. So he says, all these wonderful, all these glorious things are true of you in Christ. Just from the fact that you are a believer. Just from the fact that you are in him, God has said all these glorious things of you. Now in the second half of the chapter, which is verses 15 through 23, then Paul prays in light of this. He says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. He says, I'm just so thankful to the Lord for, for you. And who is the you he's talking about? I think he's talking about, like I said, this new company of believers in the dispensation of grace. Those who are believing in Christ, now in this dispensation. He says, I've heard about you and I'm excited. I'm excited about all the things God has done for you in Christ. 
And he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And so what is Paul's prayer for, for them slash for us, for believers in, in, in Christ in this dispensation? What's his prayer for us? That we might know him, that we might know God. That, that God would in, increase our knowledge and our understanding of himself and of what he's doing and of what he's doing in us. So that's Paul's prayer uh, in light of this. Now he, he, he goes on and, and in his prayer, he, his desire for us to know these things is so great that he starts teaching us some of the things he wants us to know in the prayer. You know, just starting in verse 20 there, that which he wrought in, when he, in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him in his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, and placed all things under his feet, and so forth. So he's even teaching us some of the things he wants us to know that he's praying that we'll know in this portion. So that's chapter 1. First of all, all the things God says that are true of us in Christ, and then his prayer for us is that, which is that we will know these things and we'll understand Christ and his love for us. So then in Ephesians chapter 2, we go on there and now we are talking about, first of all, verses 1 through 10, being raised up and seated with him. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now again, I, I can't get too deeply into any one of these sections here. Um, but uh, as I look at this in the Greek, there are two very important phrases in Greek that are similar, but they're very, very different. And one is being dead in sins, and one is being dead to sins. And uh, obviously, there, those are two very different concepts. But when I look at, at this phrase in, in Greek, and they've translated it dead in sins. But these two phrases, the one dead in sins, that's usually the Greek word en, en, a lot like our English word I, en, in. And, and then the word for sins, in, uh, it's usually in the genitive case, in sins. No one wants to say dead to sins, there is no word for two, it just gives uh, the word for dead, and then the word for sins in the dative case. And the dative case just means you, you, you can just kind of assume the word two should be there. That's the dative case. And uh, there, are, there are multiple examples of this. I don't have time to give them to you. But as I look at this phrase in the Greek, this is not that first phrase, dead, then the Greek word en, and then sins in the genitive. This is the second phrase, the word dead, and then the word sins in the dative case, which is translated dead to sins, every other time it appears other than here. So I don't think he's talking about being dead in sins. He's talking about us currently being dead to sins. Then it says, in which you used to live. Now this is a lot of English words, but it's translating a single Greek word. It's just a, a simple word, it's P-O-T-E, pote. And that word, it means, if I would try to put it into English, it would be at some time or other. It's very indefinite as time. You almost shrug your shoulders when you say it. Potek. Just at some indefinite time is the idea of it. It says, at some time or other, you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit was an outwork in those who are disobedient. Now, you, you can see that the people who translated this passage, they think it's all about salvation. Remember what I told you. This book is all to people who are in Christ. You're already past salvation when you get to this book. So I don't think Paul is talking about salvation. No, it's very true that we were dead in sins, and that we follow this world totally, and then that, that then God saved us. Praise God for that. But I don't think that's what he's talking about here. He's saying that we who are dead to sins, still, at, at some time or other in our lives, we don't act like it. We don't always act like we're dead to sins. At some time or other, pote, some indefinite time, we act like the world around us. We get swept up in the flow. Uh, Satan, the prince of the power of the air. And, and nowadays with this whole uh, four elements, air, uh, wind, fire, water, you know, it's in a, a lot of computer games and stuff, and people are familiar with that. And I think when they hear uh, prince of the power of the air, they think that Satan's special magic is air magic. Uh, there are people who said, airplanes, you, you, man can never fly because Satan's the prince of the power of the air, and if you went up there, you'd go into his realm. Oh well, no, I don't think that's what he's talking about, but uh, the air there has the idea of the atmosphere. You ever heard somebody say, wow, the air in here is getting kind of thick. 
Well, what are they, it's not really anything with the air, it's with the atmosphere. The, the atmosphere is emotionally charged, right? You say the air is getting kind of thick. So Satan, he's the prince of the power of the air. That doesn't mean air magic is his specialty. That means that he has the power that's behind the atmosphere of this world. The whole atmosphere we live in it, it is said is dictated by Satan. He's the prince of the power of, of this atmosphere we live in. And there are times when we, have, when we as believers who are dead to sins, that at some time or other in our lives, we, we just go with the flow. We act like the people around us. Then in verse 4, it says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us, and I, if you look at Greek, all these, all these verbs are present tense, not past tense. They're translating it past tense because they want to make this passage soteriological. But they're all present tense in the Greek if you look them up. Uh, he makes us alive with Christ, even when at some time or other, pote is there again, we are dead in, in, uh, dead to sins, it is by grace we have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him. So I think what this is telling us is not about salvation, although, like I said, praise God for the truth of salvation, but it's telling us that even when we don't act like what we are, we don't act like we're dead to sins, we don't act like we're believers, in fact, we get caught up in the flow of the world around us. And we just act in conformity with the atmosphere that surrounds us. Even then, God is raising us up and seating us with Christ. Even in those moments when we're most letting him down. Even in those times when we're acting like the world around us and, and getting into the flow and, and getting caught up in the atmosphere of this world, God is still raising us up and seating us together with Christ even then. And that's obviously totally through his grace. And then verse 7, he says, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So he's going to show how rich his grace is toward the fact that he took people like us, sinful, corrupt, fallen people, and raised us up and seated with Christ. What better example of his grace could there be? And I believe we will be, maybe to, to all ages to come, living object lessons of God's grace and how much God poured out his grace in us, took sinful fallen people like us, raised us up and seated us together with Christ. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. God would do that for us. Because bottom line is that it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So it's not that good works aren't important, but they're the result of our being saved and not the, not the way it's accomplished. So raised up, seated with Christ. That's verses 1 through 10. Then verses 11 through 22, we have the two made one in Christ. And Mike has talked some about this. It says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision, by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. So he says to these people, you, you were without Christ, you were foreigners. Uh, if, if you would go to Israel, uh, you would just be foreigners there. And that means you were foreigners to the covenants of promise. You had, you had no hope, it says, without hope. And that means without expectation. We use our word hope for, like, I buy a lottery ticket, hope I'll win the lottery. But well, that's, that's a pretty faint hope. That's a pretty vain hope. But that, no, the idea in the Bible is of an expectation. It's like a child who's hoping for Christmas. Well, it's going to come, but he's waiting for it expectantly. And so he says that you were without any expectation that this was going to change at any time. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. So he says he broke down the law which divided you, which divided those, those Jews who had free access to God in the land who could go to the temple and meet with God. And they had the covenants and they had the land and they had the promises. And... and the, the wall between those and, and the ones outside, the ones who didn't have all that, it broke down the wall. So the two are now made one in Christ. There's no more division. 
So that brings us on to Ephesians chapter 3. So we've had, what, all the things that God says of us that are true in Christ, and that God's desire for us in, in Paul's prayer in the light of that, and that we would get to know uh, God's great love for us and, and the things he would have us to know. In chapter 2 we have uh, that even, even though we who are in Christ don't always act like it, still God raises us up, raises us up and seats us together with Christ. Then we have the two, uh, those who had, who lived in the land, had free access to God, and those who were, who were cut off by uh, their not, not having access to the law, that those two are made one. But now in chapter 3, and in verse 1, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Well, it says for this reason, but I, as I look at it in, in the Greek, uh, I, I can't see the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, and I can't think reason when I see charis. It doesn't matter if I cross my eyes and unfocus them and look at it upside down. I, I can't see reason. What I see when I see the word charis is grace. So Paul says, for this grace, in light of this grace. What grace is that? Well, it's the grace he's been talking about, the great grace that God has shown toward us today. Those of us who are in Christ, it's, it's because of this grace, not because of this reason, but because of this grace. And I suppose grace is the reason, if you really want to say reason, but it's for this grace, I, Paul, the person of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, but then he almost breaks into a sentence here. Because he says, surely you have heard about the administration or the dispensation of God's grace that was given to me for you. So here he starts speaking about God's present administration. And I've said that if the book of Ephesians is the book of God's present purpose, in some ways chapter 3 is the chapter of God's present purpose, because it so much talks about God's work today. And it's almost given as an interruption, where Paul breaks in and says, surely you've heard about this. And then he goes on to explain it to us. And the first thing is the administration of God's grace. Now, that, the old English, they had that be dispensation. But the Greek word there is oikonomia. It comes from two words, oikos, which means house, and nomos, which means law. So you have oikonomia, which means a house law or house rule. But we can see the, the, the way the word used, it developed to mean more than just a house. Because there's a passage in Romans where it says, the house ruler of the city. I think in a lot of our translations, it, it translates it, the steward of the city or uh, commissioner of public works or make up some, some uh, kind of a translation like that. But it really means the house ruler of the city. But see, they, it, they'd expanded the word. It didn't just mean the house anymore. Because now it could be referring to a city. So it really means rule or uh, an administration. Administration in action is almost the idea. The, 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 poli the enacted policies of an administration. So, you know, administration can sit on his hands and not do much of anything, but the oikonomia is the administration really in action. And so God's administration is acting today in grace. God is acting toward the world in grace, like I was mentioning, and like I said in my, in my pamphlet. God's work today is totally in grace. In the past, God had sometimes worked in grace, sometimes in judgment. Sometimes he, he had given love and favor to people who didn't deserve it, regardless of whether or not they deserved it. That was grace. Sometimes he gave people exactly what they deserved, based the punishment or rewards on what they'd done, and that was judgment. But in this dispensation, in this administration, God's policy today is to act totally and exclusively in grace. He says, surely you've heard about this. And then he says, that is the, the mystery or the secret which was made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. So he says, and, and surely you've, you've heard about the secret. Well, what secret is this? What secret is he talking about? Now this is, this is not the same as the secret in Romans. This is not the same as the secret in 1 Corinthians. There are various truths that God calls secret, and they're just things that hadn't been revealed before in any of God's prior revelations. So we shouldn't think that, that there's one giant body of truth called the secret. We, when we come upon secret in any book, we have to ask, what is the secret? And what is he talking about? And he, he says a few other things in verses 4 and 5, but he finally gets around to telling us what the secret is. In verse 6, where he says, uh, This mystery, this secret, is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. 
And as Mike already mentioned, these, these three important words here, the word heirs, the word members, or, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, the word heirs, the word body, and the word sharers, uh, they all have a common prefix in Greek, which means either co or equal or joint, something along those lines. So he says that all nations are now joint heirs, uh, they're, they're a joint body or joint members of a body, and they're joint sharers, joint partakers in the promise in Christ Jesus. So joint members, joint heirs, joint sharers, or equal members, or joint members, whatever you want to make it. But they're equal, they're joint, they're on the same basis. Now this was a secret, this was a mystery, and, and the mystery, the secret, wasn't that God was going to bless all nations. It had been revealed all the way back in Genesis where God told Abraham, yeah, in, in you, in your seed, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Yeah, first of all, in Abraham, then in, in Abraham's seed, all nations of the earth were going to be blessed. So all nations were going to be blessed, but they were always going to be blessed in Abraham. They are always going to be blessed through Israel. They are always going to be blessed through that nation. And that nation would be the head, uh, the, the source of those blessings, and the other nation would be the tail, the recipients of those blessings. But here he's revealing a secret that was never revealed before, which was that now all nations are being blessed equally, co-equal, jointly. See, that had never been revealed before, a time when all nations would be blessed on an equal basis. Then starting in verse 7, he, he talks about his purpose in all this. He says, I became a servant of this gospel that by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches. And, and this can mean um, uh, untraceable or untrackable. You can't trace them out. You can't really discover them. It's like if you're a detective and you're looking for clues and you want to follow the clues to solve the mystery. Well, you can't follow out the clues to discover the, the riches of this grace because... They're unsearchable, they're untraceable, they're untrackable. No matter how hard you look, no matter how big your magnifying glass is, no matter if you're smart as Sherlock Holmes, you're not going to be able to trace these things out. Because these riches are unsearchable. And yet, these riches are, I believe, are the riches of God's grace being poured out on the world today. And, and we know that God doesn't take away all the bad things out of this world. But he is adding his grace into the world. He is blessing this world richly through his grace. And yet he does it in unsearchably in ways that we can't trace out, we can't track out. And then uh, in verse 10, it's, he says, His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So in, in chapter 2 we learn that in, in the ages to come, in God's eons to come, he is going to show forth the riches of his grace that through us as his living object lessons of grace. But now, through the church, he says, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. So now, we are almost a, on the stage where the, the great play of God's grace is being acted out, and those heavenly rulers and authorities are the audience. They're watching and learning about the manifold wisdom of God through what is, God is doing with us. Now, um, in verse 12, we have another statement of, of something that we have in Christ. And I have to mark this one out and mention it specially because it's, it's such a staggering thing. And when I was uh, teaching through Ephesians, I gave a whole sermon just on this verse because I think it's such a staggering thing. It says, In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Uh, the King James puts it, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence. We have bold access to God. Now this is an amazing thing if we stop and think about it. But this is, is the great and glorious God of the universe. Think about if you were standing before the greatest king who ever lived on earth. You would, you would probably be pretty frightened. You might go in there trembling because the greatest king who ever lived on earth, he had absolute power, didn't he? If he got mad at you, he could, he could order you killed and you'd be killed instantly. So um, imagine going before the greatest king on earth. But how much greater then the greatest king on earth is God. So much greater. So much bigger. Going before him should be 
so much more a, a scary thing then. And yet Paul tells us that in Christ, we can go before him boldly and with confidence. We have freedom and confidence to enter before God. Walk in maybe like the king's little children. These little children, they don't enter trembling when they enter before the king. They just run up to him and grab his knees and say, Daddy. Because to them, he's, he's not the king, he's just, their, he's just their daddy. They enter boldly and with confidence. It says, that's how we can enter before God in Christ. We can come boldly. We have confident access to God. And, and that in itself is, is a staggering thing, even, even setting aside all the other things he said of us in Christ. That is an incredible thing that we can enter before God freely and with confidence. Now, in light of all these things, Paul prays, again, 14 through 21, just like chapter 1, he said all the great things that are true of us in Christ, and then he prayed in light of it. He does the same thing in chapter 3. He says all the great things that are true of God's work today. And then he says, for this reason, again, it's for this grace in the Greek, for this grace, in light of this grace, and what grace he's just set forth, that we have freedom and confident access to God, boldness to come before God. In light of this grace, he says, I kneel before the Father. And verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in the inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So again, he wants us to really grasp and know and understand how great God's love toward us is. How great His grace toward us is. How great His plans toward us are. And, and that's the purpose, again, of these first three chapters of Ephesians, is to let us know those great plans of God. And it's God's desire for us that we would know these things. Now, when dispensationalists are, are teaching through Ephesians, often at times like we, it seems like we get through the first three chapters and there's so much great stuff there, you get to four through six, and it almost seems like, like kind of a letdown after all the great truths of the first three chapters. But I don't think when God wrote it that he thought of it as a letdown. I don't think that he thought of it as, oh, I got all the important stuff down, now no, all the not-so-important stuff. No, I think to God, this was, was the crucial follow-up to those first three chapters. Again, like I said, as it translates in the King James, this is the worthy walk. So he says, now that you know that all these things are true of you in Christ, how should you live then? How should you behave in light of all these things God has done for you? And again, to God, that's just as crucial as knowing these things in the first place, I think, is now that you know them, how do you respond? So the last three chapters are the worthy walk in Christ. Now, uh, the first thing we have here is the unity of the Spirit. When verse 3 says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another through love. And I think that follows right on through all, from all these things God has done for us in Christ. Is that if we understand that all these wonderful things that are true of us have been done totally by God's grace, that we, that we didn't earn any of them, that just because we're in Christ, just because we believe in Him, God has done all these wonderful things for us, then I think we can understand that our response to that should be to be humble and gentle and patient with each other. There's no cause for pride here. There's no cause to think that we're better than the people around us. Because everything we have from God has been done completely by His grace. And we didn't earn it at all. All we did was believe in Christ. And then God showered this, these unimaginable riches upon us. So in the light of that, we have, we have no cause to be proud. And we have no cause to be arrogant or, or haughty or hurtful to the people around us who maybe don't know these things as well as we do. In the light of all God has done for us in Christ, we have every reason to be humble and patient and gentle with those around us. And he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So he says, what you need to do is keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, notice he says, don't, don't try to form, he doesn't say try to form the unity of the Spirit uh, by, you know, getting together with other Christians, finding certain generic truths you can all agree on, and then sitting down in the same church service. No, you can do that, but that's trying to form unity. He doesn't say here try to form unity. He says keep the unity of the Spirit. So the unity of the Spirit is there. The only question is whether you're going to keep it or not. And the unity of the Spirit here revolves around seven great truths that he lists in verses 4 through 6. 
He says, if you keep these seven truths, and then you've kept the unity of the Spirit. It doesn't matter if anybody else keeps them with you or not. You've kept the unity of the Spirit. And that unity is there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, the one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So he says, guard these seven truths, and then you'll have kept the unity of the Spirit. But then uh, he says, um, now I, I suppose when you, when you read this, you say, well, yeah, but, but why can't all Christians be unified? I mean, look at the book of Acts, where all the believers are together, and, and they were all uh, have, had uh, one heart and one soul. It's like we would say in English, their hearts were beating as one. They were all together, they were all unified. How come things can't be that way today? How come there have to be all these divisions and, and strifes and arguments between believers? And so I, I think he, he goes back and reviews a little bit for us here. He says, to every one of us is given grace according uh, as, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. So he says, look, you have to receive the grace from Christ that he apportions to you. Now when Christ ascended on high, he led captives in his train, he gave gifts to men. He gave them gifts. Uh, he gave them miraculous gifts. Uh, he gave them apostles and, and prophets. He gave them people who could lead them all to unity. You know, it wouldn't be hard to be unified if, if you and your brother believer had a disagreement about a scripture passage, and you could just go to God's local prophet and say, what does this passage mean? And he'd give you God's word on the matter. Well, I suppose then he could shake hands and say, well, uh, I guess I was wrong, or I guess you were wrong, or whoever was wrong. Maybe we were both wrong. And then go your way and be unified because you just got the word from God's prophet. See, God gave gifts to men that unified people in the past. But see, we don't have gifts today. What, what do we have today? We have God's grace. We have the word of God. But he, he, he ascended up on high. He gave gifts to men that unified them all. But he doesn't give us those gifts today. So his gift today is the unity of the spirit. That's the unity he gives us today. He doesn't give us one heart, one soul like they had in uh, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4 there. So then it said, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach what unity in the faith. In other words, unity in what we believe. He says, He gave apostles and, and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers so that we can all reach unity in what we believe. But guess what? God isn't giving those anymore today, is he? Uh, we might have uh, evangelists and pastors and teachers, but they aren't God-given. They're, they're appointed by men. Maybe they've gone to Bible schools and learned a lot, or, or whatever the reason. They aren't given by God. See, when God was giving those men, it brought everybody into unity of what they believed. How, co how could it help but do that? Because if God gave the teachers, every teacher would be teaching the same thing. If God gave the pastor, every pastor would be leading the sheep in the same direction. If God gave the evangelists, there wouldn't be disagreement about what exactly the gospel is. And boy, you hear different gospel messages, it's obvious that the evangelists can't even agree on what the gospel is. So when God gave these gifts, well then people reached the unity of, of belief. But today what do we have to do? Well, we just have to search out the Bible and, and discover the truth of God and get on board with that. Whether or not we're going to be unified with other people, well, we, we have to leave that up to God and I guess up to them uh, to study the Bible for themselves. We can try to help them, of course, come to the truth. Uh, but there are no God-given gifts in order to bring them there. So once they're brought to unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. So he says this was, this was God's purpose in giving all these gifts. And we can know that that's what God desires for us today. We might not have God-given leaders to bring us there, but this is still God's desire for us today, that we become mature. That we become mature, that we know these truths, we can't just be blown about by every wild doctrine anybody wants to throw at us, and we know so little of the word, we're just carried away by it. Now, in verse 17 through the end of chapter 4 here now, we've gone over the unity of the Spirit, 
and then um, how, how God is what God's desire for us today, and a little bit about why they had more unity in the past maybe than we have now. But now he's going to talk about what I would call put off the old and put on the new. He says, now that you're in Christ, you want to walk this worthy walk? Well, part of that walk involves putting off your old lifestyle and putting on the new. Verse 22, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, and the King James puts that, uh, the old man. That's the old way of life. He says to put off your old self. Take off that old you like a suit of clothes. Put off that old way of living, uh, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. He says change your mind about the ways you used to think. And when you were that old man, before you were in Christ, you had a way of thinking that just wasn't right. It wasn't after Christ. Now you need to put on a new mindset. And then he says to put on the new self. So like a new suit of clothes, put on a new self. And this new self, he says, is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So take off your old self like an old suit of clothes. Put on the new self that's created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he goes through a bunch of specific examples. Put off falsehood. Instead, put on speaking truthfully with your neighbor. Put off, uh, in your anger, do not sin. Put off uh, sinning based on losing your temper. Uh, and, and do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. In other words, let your anger go. Do not give the devil a foothold. And he says, he who has been stealing, put off stealing. Steal no longer. Put it off. Instead, put on what? Put on working. Doing something useful with your hands so you can give to share with those in need. So instead of thinking about stealing from those who have more than you, think about working so you have something to give to those who have less. So this section is all about put off and put on. Put off the old lifestyle, put on the new. That brings us to chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5, uh, again, we're going through the worthy walk. And he mentions uh, there are three sections here that talk about three different aspects of this worthy walk, or this worthy lifestyle. First of all, verse 1, he says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Imitate God. Just like a little child will imitate his parents. You imitate God just like a dear little child. And then he says, And live a life of love. Because just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And the King James doesn't say live a life of love, it says walk in love. Again, that means the same thing. Walk in love. Live, your, live a lifestyle of love. Now, just like Christ loved us. Act like Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. You act that same way. Live a lifestyle of love for each other. So then verse 8, he has the next one. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live, or walk, as children of light. Walk as children of light. Walk in the light. Don't walk in the darkness. Now we understand that darkness can, can stand for wickedness, or it can stand for ignorance of the, of the truth and deception. So he says, don't walk in darkness anymore. Walk in the light. Walk as children of the light. People whom the light has produced. So your, your understanding of God and his word produces a lifestyle that mirrors that understanding. So your lifestyle isn't disconnected from your understanding of God and Christ. Your lifestyle goes right along with it. Now that's verses 8 through 14. And then verse 15, he says, Be very careful, then, how you live. Again, it's, it's a walk in, in the old King James, the, the worthy walk. He says, Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. So the last one, he says, Walk wisely. Walk wisely. 